Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Viet Nguyen. Um, we are here on an afternoon after a nice lunch, so I'm gonna try to keep things interesting for you the best I can. Um, here is the link to the uh, my, a Google Drive that has these slides. And the reason I'd like you, you normally don't get the slides in advance, although some of the presenters have uh, made them available, is that I'm not, I don't typically do this tutorial in a lecture format. It's usually hands-on. And so the way, I'm, I'm gonna still do it in a similar way that I, could, I normally do it, but the handouts for the slides will walk you through how to create these scenarios when you use the, the ClinFire tool. So the, the thought here is that we have this session, a break, and another session, and over the course of those two sessions, we're gonna go over how to use the tool, how to create the clinical scenario, and I'm gonna show you how I would build the, uh, the scenario and the fire instances if, the t if you had the tool up open in front of you. And the reality is, uh, most of the day tomorrow, I'll be up in the clinical track uh, table. And if you wanna create some of these resources, I'll be there and I can help you, because that's usually what we do. Um, so, a little bit about me. I'm a, an internist, a pediatrician, clinical informaticist. Been working in in interoperability for about 15 years terminology space, did some work in CDA, and uh, I uh, realized how fortunate I am about five or six years ago, Graham asked me to get involved in FHIR because they were building out the spec and they realized that they felt they didn't have enough clinical input into building the, the specification and, and getting an understanding, is, is this fitting the clinical um, needs of the users? And so at the time I was uh, in, uh, in industry and now I'm a consultant, and I also am a volunteer chief medical information officer or chief medical officer for Health Services Platform Consortium, and it's a, a group not that doesn't create standards, but implements those standards to create reference implementations based on projects. Everything from terminology, they do work with SIMI, we're working with uh, business process modeling to take standards that exist and put them into um, reference implementations so folks can see how they might work. Uh, one of the things that we're gonna use in this demo uh, that I would encourage you to take a look at is the uh, HSPC um, developer sandbox. It's developers.hspconsortium.org. And you can sign up as this individual developer. You can get your own sandbox. You can do a turnkey, and it's literally turnkey. And, and uh, fire, fire up your own uh, fire uh, server. on a, uh, It's a happy server uh, on a, an Amazon uh, Web Services uh, uh, based uh, environment, and you can have both an open endpoint and you can have a, a secure endpoint. It supports uh, smart and uh, uh, CDS hooks too. So it's a great environment for developing your applications. Um, I'm also involved in uh, H, uh, uh, HL7's DaVinci initiative, which is a payer initiative, and so I have a talk on, two talks on Thursday about that. And in general, I've been helping educate clinicians uh, about FHIR for the past uh, three or four years. So I always kind of like to level set. I know this is mostly a developers um, conference, but how many developers do we have here? Okay, so I'm totally honest about, I can get down to the stack reasonably well, but if you get down to the code, software code level, you're a little too deep in the stack for me. So I, I try to help with the clinicians, helping them understand um, how, to, how to work with the clinical data. How many clinicians do we have in here? Awesome, and my hope is, with these, is that you already understand <laughs> basic fire. Uh, if you don't, there are lots of great courses around that because we're not, I'm gonna use all these, all the fire terms and I'm gonna assume you kinda know what I'm talking about. Um, the, to do the uh, um, exercises, you'll need your computer, internet access, and a browser, and in general, it works better on Chrome than any of the other browsers. So my, my hope in these two sessions are you to understand how to think about clinical scenarios, because as a terminologist, one thing I've learned is that we come into every conversation with our own history of what words mean, and clinicians being one are some of the worst, because you just take something like clinical guideline, clinical pathway, and we have our ideas of what we think that means. But in the fire space, I try to uh, bring us together in this unified idea of what, what we're using that term in, in our discussion. Uh, want to help you get a sense of how you can organize a clinical scenario so that you can uh, use ClinFire effectively, set up ClinFire 
use the servers, understand how the, the servers uh, work for you, and then we're gonna do uh, some exercises around looking at data that's already on a server, and then uh, learn how to use and create simple um, scenarios where you actually create Fire instances. And one of the big things I love so much about Fire is that in five minutes, if we were sitting down next to each other one-on-one, -on -one, you could create your first Fire resource that validates in that five minutes. I don't, for those of you who've worked in CDA, and I love CDA and it has its great value, it took me like two weeks, three weeks, sitting with those CDA implementation guides to create my first valid CDA. But in Fire, we do it much faster. Um, so, and I want to encourage you, uh, as the clinicians in the room, to get involved in Fire because we really need that input to say, we create these resources, we think we have, uh, they fit your needs, but give us some situations where we would use it uh, in order to uh, check to see if, if it really works. And so what we do at the end of the week or during the HL7 working group meetings is get the clinicians together. We use ClinFire. We do some pre-work in the weeks beforehand to create some of these scenarios. And we try to create fire resource instances with the goal that if it works, great. It's another example that we can point to of how you would use a resource. And if it doesn't work, because what we want to model isn't being supported by fire, it, gives, it tells us there's a gap. And we feed that information back to the uh, standards community to help fill that gap. So it's, it's beneficial all around. So let's talk a little bit about scenarios. So a scenario can be really small or really large. And really small could be a simple office visit. It can be a simple exchange of information. Or when we first started Clinicians on Fire, we created a whole narrative around a patient with diabetes who comes in with uh, an infection, who goes to the ER, gets a whole bunch of labs, gets admitted, and we realized, wow, that's really great, but we can't really attack that in a one-day session because there are so many data elements. There's the factor of time. And so it was very difficult to um, try to organize the information in a way that we could, we could really try to test fire. So my uh, recommendations are to start small. So small in that you have a set of data you want to work with and you want to try to see, can I represent this data uh, accurately in fire? That's a good way to start. And we've done that in the clinicians on fire. And what we're now doing is looking at processes. How do we take that data and go from a medication order to a, a, a medication administration to you know, the, the other steps? Uh, one example we did in uh, New Orleans is that we took uh, any pediatricians in the room? No. For those who trained as, as physicians, you know, uh, when a newborn is born and they're in the hospital, there's a form, a one-page form pediatricians fill out that's really common. Basic vital signs when they, when they were born, their weight, length, whether or not they got hepatitis B, uh, their, uh, did they get their heels uh, pricked for the uh, screening for newborn diseases, uh, physical exam. And what happens in this form is we collect all this form, the baby's there for 48, 72 hours, and we tear off a copy of the form, separated form, put one in the chart, and we hand one to the parents. And the hope is that that parent takes that to their pediatrician in the first visit. So this, that's today's interoperability for the newborn record. But what we did in the Clinicians on Fire session was that we took that form, we broke it down to look at all these fields of the birth weight, the uh, head circumference, and then did what we're going to show you here is did this, this fire gap analysis and, and some mapping to see how would we take this form and have a fire representation of it. Because in my mind, if you can represent that information in that form in a fire format, you've now scaled a useful uh, activity and a useful interoperability paradigm to close to 4 million live births a year. That's huge. So we look for kind of use cases like that, at least I personally I do. Um, again, we can look at, at a, a point in time or a series of events. Um, I would recommend starting with a point in time. I have a, an example where we um, were teaching some students about fire and we took the Framingham risk calculator for cardiovascular risk. And if you look at those, um, those data elements, it's blood pressure, it's LDL cholesterol, it's whether or not the patient smokes or has diabetes. And we said, wow, seven elements. They're all structured and we were able to represent all of them as fire resources, and then we could, we had the patients create that data and then use the smart Python library, for those of you in academics, uh, it's a great library, and had them create a simple application to pull that data, do the, parse it out, and calculate the Framingham risk. Uh, 
So those are really good examples of, of fairly narrow um, things you can do to try out your experience with fire. Those, the MedCalc, if you ever go to MedCalc or Medscape has these calculators, it's a great place to, to start out. Um, one of the things we recognized over time too is that the point in time scenarios are great, but healthcare is, is a series of events and, and, uh, and a process. And so what we're looking at now, what we're trying to do is the, the notion of workflow. How does, um, how does medication ordering and, and dispensing, how do lab ordering and dispensing, and then ultimately how do you do things like care plans, which is this kind of uber workflow that involves many different entities and it's the, the data is really dynamic. And uh, so we have ongoing groups in here. I don't see Dave Carlson, but Dave Carlson's been working with the VA and uh, it's been a several uh, HL7 working group connectathons and each time they try to advance that, care, that dynamic care plan uh, use case, but they really need clinicians there to help the developers in the room understand what the data is and how it's being used by the clinicians. So, um, so some of the simple things you can do with scenarios, create lists um, and uh, other things. So, so how do you plan on, uh, to do a clinical scenario? I'm assuming hopefully most of you are starting to work on some projects and, and you want to get involved in, in uh, uh, supporting something around fire. And so what you do is you kind of have to start with the, who, who's sending the information? Is it coming from the EHR? Is it coming from an inpatient or outpatient setting? Um, who's the receiver? Is it another EHR, another provider? Could it be now we're, we're thinking about registries? We're thinking about public health organizations that are getting information. Uh, and for Da Vinci, we're thinking about uh, payers and, and the value-based care uh, paradigm. So knowing uh, what data you have available to you and uh, who is going to receive it is important. Uh, what are the data requirements for your scenario? Uh, is it structured data? We love structured data, vital signs and demographics and labs. Uh, but we know that there's still a fair amount of unstructured data, clinical notes, uh, reports, and then there are things that are kind of non-clinical administrative data, such as you know who the who's involved in the care, the organizations, and then we're getting into understanding and using the administrative data uh, around things like uh, coverage and eligibility, things like that, and, and those are being really um, tested out in Fire now too. What things can, do you have that can help you create your scenario? What kind of artifacts? I described that newborn form. It's a, it's a nice place to start because we know that that's real world. We know your uh, physicians have to capture that information. So that gives you um, a sense of uh, how you might ultimately actually have to represent that information as well. Uh, another project we're trying to work on uh, with folks is uh, with the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. And for the physicians in the room, you know, there's a form that, that uh, is uh, started when women come for their first uh, prenatal visit. And that form takes down their, their basic uh, demographic history, their past pregnancy history, of any. And then over the course of their pregnancy, each time they go see the physician, a certain amount of information is being collected. Uh, their blood pressure, their uh, measurements of the, the fundus. Uh, they might also do tests at certain points. You get an ultrasound, or you get a hepatitis B test, or you uh, get a glucose tolerance test. So that form is now a fairly standardized form that's used across the U.S. to uh, monitor the care of a woman during pregnancy. And it's an interoperability form. It's not only a data interoperability form, it's actually a, a workflow interoperability form. Because if a woman starts her pregnancy at this city and for whatever reason has to move to another city, the ideal situation is that an otherwise healthy person takes that form from the first gynecologist, hands it to the next gynecologist, and all the basic information that the second gynecologist uh, obstetrician uh, has uh, will be what they need to continue the care of the patient. So there, there's, a, there's a lot of value. And we, uh, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology is uh, sponsoring some projects around uh, formalizing that representation. Because again, if we formalize it and we are able to share that, four million live births a year. That's, that's huge. So uh, take whatever forms you have available. Uh, it's important to also think about identifiers, um, medical, whether they be medical record numbers, EMPIs, for payer use cases, uh, subscriber and, and member IDs. And then you have to think about uh, what are the terminologies you're going to use. And if you're not a kind of a terminology geek like me, you find someone to help you with that terminology. And most of the time in the US, we're thinking about SNOMED codes for condition, LOINC codes for, for labs, and uh, RxNorm codes for um, uh, medications. 
So you want to kind of have, gather all this information in advance before you do uh, uh, your scenario. And then you do what I, I've been uh, calling the, your fire gap analysis. So you have a set of information. You have a patient, let's say. You, you break that down to, what do I need to know about the patient? The weight, I meant the, not the weight, it may be a weight, but it, like demographic, basic demographic information, gender, address, location, things like that. And then you look at what fire resources are available in the 100 or so resources we have and which ones look like they are the appropriate ones to, um, to satisfy that need. And one aspect that I'd like to point out for clinicians around fire is that I, I break fire resources into three big groups. There are these kind of basic core fire resources like patient that kind of stand on their own and they don't do references to other resources. Then you have second level things, let's say medication request that requires a patient, a practitioner reference, uh, a maybe a medication reference. So that's a medium level resource. And then you have kind of the Uber ones, and Care Plan is kind of an Uber one. There are about 20 plus resources that uh, Care Plan can reference. And so I recommend starting at the, the, the smaller building blocks and working your way up to the more complex resources. But what you want to do is you, you, you take your resource and then you look and say, does that resource support um, the data, have the data elements in it that uh, I need to support in order to uh, fit my data requirements? And sometimes you realize you're going to have to use combinations for like medication. If you're going to do a medication ordering scenario, you want to make sure you can support medication requests. And then uh, also is important is to look at what profiles have already been created. So you, you hope, hopefully most of you know about the, the US core profiles. It's pretty wide implementation. And so in the DaVinci project, we want to leverage um, resources that EHR vendors have already put into production. And so the Argonaut profile slash US core profile is already in production. And so we know that that's a place where there's already a good amount of expertise. And it also are resources that are more mature. If you look at the fire spec, you'll see that the uh, resources have levels of maturity and patient and condition are like level five, which means they've been put in production uh, widely. And then you, we, you do a gap analysis kind of spreadsheet. And this is an example of one we use for, um, uh, for DaVinci. We took the, we looked at patient. We have a, a bunch of tabs at the bottom. We looked at patient and we looked at all the elements in patient and their cardinality. And from here we say, based on our generic need for this, uh, um, this data, or the data requirement, does the base profile support everything we need? And, it, and we, we check the box, yes, yes, yes. No, oh, this is nice, but we don't really need it. But since it's in the profile, we'll just take it as extra. And then uh, we'll say something else they don't have, we may add an extension. So this is really useful because it, it's already a place somebody already started for you. Um, the, the, there's always this uh, tension between using resources or profiles that are already existing and wanting to uh, constrain them down and create new profiles. And uh, it's a healthy tension because you wanna, you wanna constrain to the extent that the sender and receiver are clear about the information that they're sending and receiving, but the more you constrain it down, the less flexibility you have for existing implementers to implement. And so we have to be cognizant about that. And so, uh, uh, we're fortunate that, that the EHR vendors have been um, fairly supportive. They recognize the limitations of DSTU2 and the Argonauts, but most of them are building uh, off of three and, and planning on, on, on R4, which is, is good for us. And then with this form, the next thing you would do is you want to actually create some resource instances, right? And so the, what you would do then is use some of these columns uh, on the right to start filling out uh, example patients. So you might write your narrative and say, oh, on this patient, it's going to be John Doe. And so I have John Doe. I'm going to make John Doe a, a, a white male, uh, non-Hispanic. Uh, his birth sex is, is uh, male. We'll give him a, uh, a medical record number. And then we'll fill out some of this other form. So this is also a form you would use uh, when you actually go to use the ClinFire tool to um, create the actual resource instance. So I'm hoping I, I don't have to sell you on why it might be helpful to do these resource instances, right? Because then it'll help the developers see some, some real data to, uh, to write their applications against. So using ClinFire is what I call kind of handcrafting resources, and it's really great for you to learn how to fire works um, when you're first working with it. But there are other uh, um, 
small r resources like uh, MITRE Cynthia, where they have large volumes of, of uh, fire instances and actually have a machine, the Cynthia machine, I don't know what we call that, the framework, where you can actually create uh, 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 large volumes of patient data um, based on uh, disease modules. So you can actually create patients, and they, and uh, I would recommend, I'm a big fan of Cynthia. So syntheticmass.mitre.org has, uh, has their, uh, um, some visualizations they did where they represented uh, Massachusetts, all the counties in Massachusetts, and um, the population uh, all the way down to um, um, gender, uh, similar similarities in gender and uh, disease prevalence. So it's pretty, pretty cool. So, so here's an example of a scenario. 12-year-old boy presents with uh, pain in the right ear for three days, elevated uh, temperature on exam, has a temp of 38, and, uh, inflamed right ear, no perforations, was given the diagnosis of otitis media, prescribed amoxicillin 250 three times a day for seven days, and then followed up two days later, has a rash, some breathing difficulties, uh, and on exam has a rash on both arms, but no signs of meningitis given the diagnosis of penicillin allergy, and then antibiotics were changed to erythromycin. So if you look at this, this is pretty uh, straightforward for a clinician to kind of understand, but how would you break this down into, uh, into fire uh, components? So you would see the 12-year-old boy is a patient resource. This whole, each of these episodes might be an encounter. Um, the pain in the right ear, the itchy skin, um, the rash, and the otitis media might be conditions and we won't get into a long discussion about when you use condition, when you use observation, because they're still debatable. Um, <laughs> uh, the amoxicillin and the erythromycin are medications, and the allergy to the penicillin is an allergy intolerance. So this is a kind of a high level um, uh, gap analysis from a simple scenario. Yes? I'm going to say probably, only because I'm not a V2 guy. I, I didn't start in HL7 till, till CDA, so I didn't get delve deep in, into, H, into version two. I mean, I, I think some of these encounter would be, you know, there would be, there are probably V2 equivalents to all of these. That's a good question. Any, any V2 to fire folks in here that might provide a suggestion? Uh, the, the question was, if, if, if you could represent this today in, in V2 messages, yes. do, do you want to go straight to a, 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 a mapping towards fire? And, and I can answer, if you have the tools to do it, it, ma it makes sense. We've, we've done the mapping to the wrong site, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's possible. There is a separate uh, talk, by the way. On Graham. I, I think you'd, you'd need the right tooling, and, and I think the challenge may become in fidelity, given the differences of, the, of uh, implementations around yeah, V2. That's why the basis I was asking for, what is the migration path for existing providers? Do they again start all these story creations and scenarios and do the... I've done mostly new work, so I, I haven't had the same kind of limitations uh, on V2. So I think it, it all depends on, on uh, I guess, the cost benefit for your approach. I know there's large investments already in V2, and the reality is a lot of the integration engine uh, um, vendors have uh, mappings and, uh, and methods to do that, that translation too, so that's something else to consider. But th um, this is just a kind of a visual representation of those resources we just talked about. Uh, you could have a procedure that has a diagnostic report, and it's through the, the uh, re these are references. Um, and so for a clinician, it's useful to, to understand um, visually in your mind build that mental model of how the data fits together because it's not truly kind of hierarchical. It's kind of a network of data which you'll see in a second. Um, so these, this is a representation of how the, the data is kind of linked um, and you can put these in you know, as the text strings as well as the coded fields um, in the fire resource. So download the, the, the slides and you'll be able to follow along 
mostly. These slides that I created uh, were a little while back, um, and so the examples aren't exactly like they, they would, you would do uh, on your own, but they're pretty similar. So this is the ClinFire uh, main page, and this is where I want to give a huge plug for David Hay. Uh, he's the one who actually uh, normally teaches this uh, tutorial and has been uh, in Amsterdam, and he's out of New Zealand and wasn't able to, to be here, so I'm, I'm pinch, hit, pinch hitting for him. But he created this, uh, it's, a, it's a fire client, and uh, it has a, a set of modules, and um, on the left, and we'll go through the modules, and it, it has, we'll, we'll do a little tour of this, you can see. So you can create a user, uh, and so with the way I did the slides, it just looks like this, so you know kind of where to click, so you don't have to follow the, uh, the verbal uh, narrative. So these are the modules. The first one we use is a patient viewer. It's a simple fire client where you can connect to the fire server, and you can uh, uh, look, search for a patient uh, by name and identifiers, and then pull them into the client so you can visualize the data. Uh, you have a server query, so you can select the server, and you can, um, it has a little tool to help you write a query. So if you want to write a query against a code or an ID, it'll show you what that, that uh, query would look like. Uh, we're going to talk about Scenario Builder, which is where we actually build the scenario. He has some functionality for a logical modeler uh, that I'm going to show tomorrow in, in a clinician's profiling for a clinician's discussion. Um, and the others are, are still relatively uh, new, but some things around looking at value sets and, and building value sets. So this on the right, is uh, the, where you select your servers. And I'll have a description on how you do the servers, but here you can, you click edit, and you have a, a drop down. It has some basic servers already listed. It supports both version two and version three, uh, but you'll have to select a data conformance and a terminology server. And one of the great features, and I don't show it in the slide deck, but you can actually, if you have your own fire server, and it's an open endpoint, and you know the URL, you could uh, put that into the add server function and uh, check whether or not it does terminology and conformance, and then it'll run a test. And if, if it passes the test, you can add that server to your list. So that will help you as you're creating uh, resources for your own uh, purposes. Just some links to uh, the FHIR documentation and some videos. So uh, David's blog is uh, fireblog.com, and he does lots of great posts on FHIR in general and uh, ClinFHIR um, specifically. And then this terminology browsing. If you, if you don't already have a book, set of bookmarks, uh, it's useful to, to know where you want to look at your uh, terminology. So uh, in your, um, when you do this on your own, you want to create your, uh, a, a login. So it's an unsecured website. So don't reuse any of your passwords. And don't put any HIPAA uh, private information on there. So with respect to the server roles, a good number of you probably already understand this, but I'll just do it for completeness, is that you'll have one server that will be used to store all the patient data. That same server or another server can be used to, to check conformance uh, around profiles um, of your, of your uh, instances. And then you'll have a terminology server, because not all ser uh, servers do terminology. Um, Gram server does, Happy does, and uh, HSPC does. But that's where you want to, if you're going to do a, a SNOMED lookup, you need a server that's going to serve up SNOMED codes or LOINC codes, and so that's why you need that. And each, by identifying that ClinFire in the background knows where to look for this data. And you want to make sure that you're consistent, that you're always using the same version of Fire. So here, as you work through the, the example, you'll select the server. I'm actually going to recommend folks use the HSPC uh, care plan server for this one uh, because there's some re a really good um, uh, uh, patients. So let me show you that. So I'm going to select a patient. It, here it's Bob Anyman, but he's not here yet. But in your example, um, you're going to um, look at the server and find a patient named Betsy that has a ton of really good resources. But once you've selected the patient, um, you'll get to this screen, and this is the patient viewer screen. And uh, there are two parts that, that, that you want to use. The other ones uh, have some functionality but aren't as built out yet. But this first tab is the Resource Explorer. And uh, with the Resource Explorer, you have a list of all the resource types that are available for that patient and how many instances of that resource are in. Uh, are in. Maybe use my pointer. Um, and so if you select one of them, like this condition, you now have a list of all the uh, instances of that condition resource. And then when you click on a given instance, 
you get a view of that data. So you can look at, it, it defaults to this tree view, but you can look at the text view, uh, the JSON view, the XML view, or the references view. And what you have on the top here is a, a list of versions. By default, when you do a query on a, on a resource and you uh, retrieve it, you'll get the most recent version. But we know that data kind of evolves, and Fire keeps track of those through the version history. And so you can click on uh, the one of the numbers and get the previous versions of that resource. And then on the, uh, the right-hand side are the inward and outward references. Is anyone here uncomfortable with un the, the notion of inward and outward references? Because I've had in other discussions. But really briefly, it's the idea that this resource points to a whole bunch of resources. So they're outgoing resources. And then the, the resources that are inward are resources that have this particular condition in its, in its uh, uh, de uh, definition or in its structure. And I was trying to explain that to folks, but it didn't quite make sense. So I'm glad you guys understand it. But so you can, you can click on either the, in, uh, um, the outward, the inward reference, and change the focus and be able to, to see what the, uh, the data is. And it's really helpful uh, as you're trying to explore and, uh, and understand the structure. Yes, sir. So right, so you, uh, the scenario that you earlier mm -hmm. had in the slide, that's, that's not shown here. That's not shown here, no, no. Okay. So this is uh, exploring existing data on the server. Yes, yes. And in, in your example, I confirmed. So I, I, I asked you to, to set your, um, your server to care plan and uh, gave you a couple of different identifiers. And you would just copy that and post, paste it into the ID search and click uh, search or load. And it'll load into the screen. But the, it's similar because this is another care plan patient. Um, uh, okay, so I actually have already I'm building this out, and I didn't need to. Okay, so I really love this. This is an example of uh, the, one of the benefits of Fire. Um, this is the resource reference graph. Uh, one Sunday afternoon, I, I, I was looking at some website, and oh, there's this cool kind of graph. I wonder if, if David can can put this into ClinFire. So I sent him a quick text, uh, Skype message in New Zealand. And he said, I'll look into it. And like 24 hours later, he, he, he found a, a library and created this. So uh, when you pull up this patient, you'll see this graph. The patient, it assumes that all the, the resources, each of these boxes is a resource. And it, uh, the, uh, the screen assumes that uh, all these resources pertain to this patient. And the, uh, the graph will show all the in, inward and outward references to each of those resources. And so what you can do is you can click and scroll and zoom and, and see how these resources interact with one another. And I think for clinicians, especially those who aren't, don't have a uh, kind of tech background, it can be a little challenging to think about how, how these resources relate to one another. And when you see this, it makes sense. You'll see that this care plan has a bunch of conditions and observations and practitioners related to it. And then when you click on any uh, uh, of these, you can see what the resource looks like in either the, the tree view, text view, or JSON view. So this is really cool. So just zoom in, move it around. So we did that. So in the exercise, you'll, you'll go in, you'll load up this patient, uh, CC, Pat, Betsy, uh, in the patient ID and do a search. You'll find her, click her and, and load, or you can do Anderson. Or on some of the really large servers, like the Happy server, you can change the server. Um, you can find other patients. One thing that's really important uh, is everything starts with that, that main page. So if you change the server names, just close your other tabs and re restart the modules so that uh, it knows to look in the right place based on the new uh, servers you identified. But I, I recommend, as part of the exercise, do some explore the data to see what it looks like. So how are we doing? I'm way ahead of myself. Oh, I have five minutes, right? Oh, I'm not way ahead of myself. Great. Um, I'm going to pause here, because this next set kind of goes together, and it goes to the second, second half of, of the discussion. So I'm going to pause here and take some questions, if you have any questions. Yes, sir. Uh, is there, with the, the workflows you're creating here, is there a way to turn it into the actual uh, clinician's workflow as they're going through their EHR? Ah, so that's a really good question. So when we first started doing Clinicians on Fire, uh, the question is, uh, uh, how do you tie this to the, what, the, what they would see yeah, in the EHR? The yeah, the clinician workflow. And how does this relate to the clinician's workflow? And um, we addressed this at the first Connectathon, uh, Clinicians on Fire session. We had a seven-page narrative that we wanted to represent, which was altogether too big. And they tried to create 
uh, a, a EHR-like view of the data. The challenge was it didn't have terminology binding. It didn't have a whole bunch of things that the clinicians, because we, they were being offered an EHR view, expected EHR level functionality. So the short answer to your question is, it's purposely like this because we didn't want clinicians to think they were using an EHR. We want them to, to get to the point where they feel like they're working closer to the developer and the data layer and not the user interface layer. Because um, the user interface layer, there's a, a lot of expectations that people have. Like, oh, I, I punched in DM. Why didn't it give me diabetes? You know, it's those kind of things that when, when, when we set the, the, the stage for this tool, it doesn't, it doesn't give them the expectation of the EHR. And we don't have EHR workflows in there. So you, you almost have to think like the EHR as you're using this tool. Like, how would, how would a order dialog look? And what things would I put in an order dialog? And then how would I represent the data that comes out of that order dialog as a fire resource? So that's, that's kind of the short answer. Um, so we, thank you. Question. Mm -hmm. How would you relate to the EMPI on the search? Yeah. Sure. So if, if you had a, a modeled um, in your system, and you let's say you had your own fire server and you had a bunch of patient data instances, non-PHI even, uh, and you put uh, um, the in the uh, in the identifier, you put that that EMPI. You could search using this tool. But it it well to to a fire server, but not necessarily to an EMPI. Oh, you're like oh like a database of EMPIs and, and then do a secondary search now. Yeah. Other question? Was there another question? Mm -hmm. So how I would say it would be up to you and how you frame your, um, your clinical scenario. So if you were to take, so it would, be, it would be very relatively straightforward if you did a CBC and you just do the simple four component CBC, you could do each of those um, uh, uh, observations, the, the white blood cell, you know, the, uh, the platelets and whites and, and such, you could, each of those could be an observation, right? Observation resource. And then you would put it into either uh, have multiple components, or you could put it into a diagnostic report. It all depends on, on, on how you would want to try to, to model it, because both is, is a legitimate fire way to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I would probably look at representing each of those observations as individual operations, and then taking, looking at the application layer, how you would package those into a presentation of a report. So it, it might be, you know, because you might order a whole bunch of things, but when you deliver the, the data to uh, uh, the end user, you might select one or more of those. Uh, observations to display. And there's a really great area of anybody doing uh, genomics. There's some really good efforts around trying to represent genomic data uh, in FHIR. Yes, sir. I think the answer is SIMI. <laughs> you're you're going to say SIMI? So there's a whole effort. Uh, so the question is around uh, a mapping of clinical data to fire. And so we have high level resources like observation. And what we know is it works well for lab, really well for lab. But we want to uh, document clinical observations. Let's say your reflexes or your, you know, a, a rash or something like that. Um, there's a group within HL7 called CIMI, the Clinical Information Modeling Initiative, that's t trying to take those commonly used uh, clinical observations and building uh, a standard profile for each of these. So with the idea, it's that a clinical layer. If you look in LOINC, there are um, about 250 LOINC codes for systolic blood pressure. 
that's because they care about whether or not you do it in the left arm or you get it by a radial uh, um, artery line or some other methods. But to, at the clinical level, the clinicians need to know systolic and diastolic. And if they want to dig into how it was done, they'll dig into how it was done. And so SIMI is looking at that. What is the clinical level of abstraction so that if you're going to query an EHR and I say, I want all the blood pressures, and actually the US Corps, the Argonaut Profiles has blood pressure, you get it all ba always back the same way. So then the importance of that is you can aggregate better. So you lose something when you abstract, but you gain something in the ability to aggregate and to display data kind of consistently. So, all right, they, they told us very uh, distinctly that we're supposed to stay on time. So uh, we'll, get, we'll do a, how long is this break? It's like half an hour? Okay, so we'll be back in half an hour. Uh, if you get a chance and the, and the network looks better, download uh, the, the, the things, and then we're gonna wa walk through um, some, uh, um, creating some instances. <laughs>